Hi, everyone. This is Tara Polmeyer with Progress Texas, and I'm here with congressional candidate Mike Siegel. Mike, how are you? Hi, Tara. Uh, fantastic. Doing really good. It's been a good week. Um, so thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. You've come off of a primary runoff win, but I want to start off with like, what is keeping you grounded right now, you know, campaigning during a pandemic? Wow. Well, uh, so much. I mean, my wife and children, you know, having an eight-year-old and four-year-old at home is, is plenty to keep you grounded. And, uh, you know, big picture, knowing how much is at stake in this moment. I mean, I've been doing this work of campaigning uh, almost three years when you count my 2018 campaign and this one. And, you know, we are on the cusp of, of a tremendous victory in November. But, I mean, every day we know how many Texans are, are getting sick, uh, uh, so many people across the country dying. We have this continuing fight for racial justice. We've got a president who doesn't believe in democracy. So uh, the gravity of what we're confronting right now is enough to keep me grounded for sure. Absolutely. And you mentioned, you know, this is your second time running for the seat for Congress. And I'm curious, what is different this time, you know, and what is what is different about the campaign, especially during COVID-19? Well, sure. So, um, you know, going back to 2017, when I threw my hat in the ring, you know, I'm running in the Texas 10th, the congressional district that was seen as safely Republican. Uh, Michael McCall had been winning his races by 20 and 30 percent. And so it was a much different uh, framework then. It was like, well, let's just challenge him and, and give him a, a real contest. And, you know, we didn't win the first time. But the way I see it is, you know, when you climb Mount Everest, you need to establish a base camp first, right? And so we got it from a 19% advantage in 2016 to down to 4% in 2018. And this is about finishing the job. And so now we've built a, a lot of belief in what's possible in this race. You know, before people would say, oh, you're a nice guy, Mike, but you don't have a chance in heck of winning. You know, I'm going to send my money to MJ or somebody else. Uh, but now it's like, OK, we're a battleground district. This is really one we can flip. We can beat basically one of the most powerful Republicans in Congress. And so we've been able to build a whole movement, uh, a very powerful campaign infrastructure. But, you know, unions are on board, young environmentalists, progressives of all types. And so I think folks are really excited that we can finish the job in a few months. Absolutely. And we talk about how at internally at Progress Texas, you know, candidates really need to take a stand when it comes to progressive values. Like you have to be for something um, for Texans, I think, to connect with you. So what are you seeing when it comes to building this progressive base in Texas 10? You know, that was the key for me in the primary. I was the only candidate of the three of us who supported Medicare for all. I was the only candidate who supported a Green New Deal. I had a really strong stance on ending the war on drugs, fighting voter suppression. And that helped me build a really broad coalition. I actually won every endorsement from every Democratic group, union, environmental group. And because each organization felt like I was fighting for them, you know, Jolt Action had seen me sue Governor Abbott to stop Senate Bill 4. Uh, the Sunrise Movement saw me standing up about this coal plant out in Fayette County. And so my, my body of work of kind of being an advocate in the community helped me build this coalition. And even though ultimately in, in the primary and runoff, my two opponents and then an outside super PAC together spent three and a half million dollars against me. And we spent a million, which is great for me. Uh, but it was that you know popular movement that really carried me through that helped me win uh, you know on Tuesday night with a convincing margin, and that's what we need to beat McCall. This is a guy that has three hundred million dollars in personal wealth. We're not going to outspend him, but we can outwork him. And if we have the people, you know anything's possible. Yeah, and you mentioned I mean he's one of the most wealthy congressional representatives right now. Is that still correct? Yeah, I mean you know it fluctuates, and it seems like you know he puts his money into trusts, and you know he reports it differently. The highest number is like 450 million that he showed. You know, other times it's only 100 million, uh, but certainly ultra wealthy and out of touch and elite in every way you can imagine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you're a former educator, a former teacher, and I'm curious. I think a lot of Texas parents and a lot of Texas families right now are their minds are on school in the fall, and like, what are schools doing? Are we reopening? Are we doing distance learning? Like what do you see as the solution when it comes to schools? And what do you see our state officials doing right now that is maybe not going to work? Yeah, I mean, this is something that I feel as a parent, you know, I have a, you know, incoming kindergartner and third grader, and there's nothing more that I would like than to have my kids in school. I mean, my wife runs a, a veterinary practice in Austin. You know, I've been the one that's been doing the at-home distance learning with the kids. 
and I'd much rather be, you know, running for Congress. Um, but, you know, as a teacher, I mean, teaching is hard enough without COVID-19, right? I mean, all these students, you've got to line them up, get them uh, situated, get them engaged with learning, you know, think about the hallways, all the students, you know, running through. Sometimes you have hundreds or thousands of students in the hallways. Uh, you have decrepit buildings, sometimes not even adequate air conditioning, much less air filters that are going to get the particulates to protect us from COVID-19. And so I think we have to lead with science and with medical experts and, and what's realistic. And so where I'm at is that I'm glad that at least in this, you know, Austin region, the local school districts have delayed opening. And I'm hopeful that across Texas that will happen. I mean, there's really no safe way to have all the students uh, in, in the schools right now and protect not only them and their families, but of course, teachers, all the school workers. We don't want you know, reopening school to be the start of a massive new wave. And really, I think the, the, the rubber hits the road on the federal government's failure to basically provide direct economic aid. You know, if we were like just Canada, our neighbor to the north, guaranteeing everybody $2,000 a month uh, for as long as the crisis occurs, you know, or lo as long as it goes on, that's the kind of support the federal government can provide. You know, instead of spending these trillions to prop up the stock market, let people stay home. Those who have jobs that can work from home, work from home. Those who don't, I mean, allow folks to keep a roof over their heads, food on their table, the ability to see a doctor until we can get through this. And this idea that in Texas we're going to reopen early because Greg Abbott wants to appeal to his donor class and uh, these really right wingers. And, and then that puts us in this position we're in now where we're having this horrible surge. Or the idea that Trump's going to order the schools to reopen without a safety plan is just obscene to me. And the idea that they want to sacrifice our lives just to keep their donors and, and keep the stock market uh, propped up and happy is just obscene to me. And so I'm, I'm taking my cues from, you know, from the medical experts, from the teachers unions, the folks who are really uh, most focused on making sure that when we do open schools and it's a safe and proper way. 100%. And, you know, your district here spans kind of like a fairly large swath of Texas. And so are you seeing, what are you seeing when you, when you talk to voters, you know, across your district, what are the things that come up, you know, no matter where people are at across the state? Yeah. So the Texas 10th, you know, stretches from Lake Travis out by Volente and then, you know, about, has about a quarter of Austin and then crosses seven rural counties and ends up in the Houston suburbs of Katy, Cypress, and Tomball. And, you know, I can't treat it like a monolithic entity. You know, this is really, you've got the rural region and, and these folks have their concerns. It's more closing hospitals, lack of access to internet, uh, you know, water and air pollution from fracking and other fossil fuel industries. On the Houston side, um, you know, you're still talking about flood control. Like, are we protected from the next Hurricane Harvey? Um, you know, in Austin, you know, we have more progressive community. You might have more detailed conversations about should it be Medicare for all or, you know, something short of that. I mean, you, you can use the hashtags, the Green New Deal, and, and people know what you're talking about. But I think the overlapping interests are still, you know, it's the economy, it's jobs, and it's, and it's health care. And to me, the progressive answer to this moment we're in with 45 million plus unemployed, we still have a, crime, a climate crisis, we have massive inequality in this country. This is our New Deal moment, right? This is like when FDR, after the Great Depression, said we're going to mobilize the federal treasury, all of these resources to put millions of Americans back to work. This is one of these moments where the federal government can be the hero. Uh, and so, again, instead of spending four or five trillion to prop up stock prices, you know, let's 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 use this Joe Biden plan. I'm really uh, encouraged by the kind of Bi Biden Bernie uh, task forces including this idea to combat climate change with a major national jobs program. I mean, these are the types of solutions we need that will lift everybody up. And on healthcare, I mean, we've seen in this moment during COVID-19, we're only as healthy as our least insured community members. And I don't know if you saw that New York Times article, I think it was last week, you know, two people in Austin went to get a COVID-19 test. One paid cash and was billed $99. The other offered their insurance and was billed $6,000. I mean, how absurd and obscene is that? Then in a moment like this, when getting tested is what everyone should do if you've been exposed, it's in everybody's public health interest. The idea that there are these huge barriers to even getting the most basic medical care is obscene and it, it puts us all at risk. And so this is really a good time to be fighting for a universal health care program. 
Absolutely. And we know that, you know, Texas is one of the least insured states in the country. And we know that state officials have refused to expand Medicaid. What are some things that you would, um, I think, in addition to like Medicare for all, want to work on in Congress to help Texans who are uninsured and just looking for some health care right now? No, that's right. Um, I mean, I think, you know, 2021, there's a lot of like, you know, we have to do this first, you know, voting rights is a huge one, right? Reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act, especially if we've got the, the White House, the Senate and the House, that's a big one. It's the foundation for a lot of other things. But healthcare, I mean, making major progress on healthcare is huge. And, you know, obviously, Joe Biden was kind of more for the public option. Uh, but I think that we just have to push as far as we can. If we can add 20 million, 40 million more people to the, you know, the, the ranks of the covered, that would be a huge step forward. And so to me, um, the idea that a state like Texas can say, well, we don't want to split the cost on Medicaid expansion, so therefore we're just going to leave. I mean, what was the number that came out the other day? Four and a half, five million uninsured in this state is just obscene. It's it's dereliction of duty. It's it's. I mean, these people who profess to be pro-life but are letting people die for lack of health coverage, it's, it's obscene. And so, um, and to me, if we have this moment, let's say we do sweep, uh, all the branches of government this fall, uh, we really have to take advantage. We have to deliver for the American people. And if we can do that in those first two years, I have no doubt that we'll get another two years to keep pushing forward. I mean, if we think back to the New Deal, that was 15 years. Of course, FDR did four terms as president, but it, we might need that level of you know reconstruction in this country to rebuild the middle class and get people back on sound footing. I want to talk a little bit about the movement that we are seeing when it comes to racial injustice, you know, across the country and here in Texas. When it comes to holding police accountable, what are the measures that you support and what other solutions do you see for Texans? Right on. Yeah, this is a huge issue for me. And, you know, I uh, went to law school to be a human rights lawyer, you know, practice civil rights law, I've been a part of, you know, cases uh, that involve uh, racial profiling, I've uh, challenged police policies that you know demonize Latin American and, and Black youth, uh, or sorry, Latino and Black youth. Um, and I also come to this as as a parent. You know, my wife is uh, born in Nigeria in West Africa, raising two children, uh, mixed race who are perceived as Black. And I want Texas to be safe for them. And so I I absolutely uh, I am, am in agreement and accord with the movement for Black Lives, the demand that we essentially re envision public safety in this country. I mean, let's acknowledge that. You know, we have 401 years of, uh, of racist oppression dating back to the arrival of slaves on, on the East Coast shores, going through the Jim Crow era, even, you know, the war on drugs, which as, you know, some of your viewers have probably read the Michelle Alexander book that the war on drugs is basically the new Jim Crow uh, attacking black and Latino communities. And so we need to first, you know, recognize that we have this problem. You know, uh, Joe Biden called it the original sin of this country. And in the South, the first so-called police forces were, were, you know, pursuing escaped slaves, you know, the so-called slave patrollers. So let's recognize this legacy. Let's admit we have a huge problem here. And then let's also look at, you know, what it takes to really eradicate racism in our police force. Uh, Congressman Ted Lieu said, you know, in regards to the killing of George Floyd, that it took a whole village to allow that officer to kill George Floyd. And what he meant was there was those three other officers that stood by idly. It did nothing while George Floyd's neck was on the pavement. There were all the people in the police department that knew these 18 complaints had been filed against that officer and it still allowed this person to have a gun and a badge. There were all the civilians, the city council, the mayor that knew these types of officers were still in the forest but didn't do anything about it. So we need a comprehensive reckoning with public safety and, and, and uh, these types of policies. You know, I, I, as a you know, member of the Austin community, I would certainly like to see uh, you know, our city look at different ways to respond to emergencies. You know, a police officer uh, who has gone through the academy for a few months is certainly trained to deal with certain types of situations, but maybe not a mental health crisis, maybe not de-escalating a conflict among neighbors uh, that doesn't require a gun to mediate. And so I want to see us look at all sorts of different ways to respond to public safety uh, emergencies uh, that doesn't necessarily involve sending a police officer every time. And I also want us to look at the root causes of violence in the community, because we know that poverty in particular is a big driver of, of public safety issues. I mean, if, if we can make sure everyone has a home, if we can make sure everyone has a job who wants it, 
uh, if we can make sure that uh, people can see a doctor without worrying about medical debt and bankruptcy. I think that kind of safety net will improve public safety and that will kind of be a long-term uh, commitment to really making sure we have a, a safe uh, and protected community. So this is a national conversation that needs to happen with Congress. We need to maybe change the way these grants come down to local areas. I mean, I've personally seen how, you know, uh, for example, some of these anti-gang grants that come from the federal government they basically encourage racial profiling because if you can document more gang members in your community, you get more money. So that creates this in incentive every time you find some, some kid on the street, well, can I mark him or her down as a gang member? And so uh, from the federal government, in terms of the incentives, we need to really examine that, make sure we're, we're you know, supporting approaches to true public safety. I, I love that you said, you know, we need to move to these community-based models of public safety and that like there are things at the federal level, you know, a lot of, I think the calls to action right now are at the local level, but this is every level of government that, you know, there's something to be reckoned with here. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, we can, you know, there, there's a lot of reforms and I've got a whole platform about it, you know, national database uh, for police misconduct, uh, you know, looking at qualified immunity, uh, should we be, re you know, making sure that cops, um, you know, who basically, what, what qualified immunity is, is you have committed a constitutional violation, but yet you still are found not liable. And so why does that create uh, perverse incentives for officers, you know? And so how are we going to have real accountability? And, you know, what I want to look for is community control of the police. You know, we need to make sure that police officers are accountable to the community, uh, not just their police union president who's, you know, negotiating the next contract. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have a question here from Sula on how do we overcome gerrymandering and what steps can we take as citizens? Well, that's a big one. Um, you know, the federal government, uh, you know, Congress, we could pass a bill to impact uh, at, least, at least the redistricting of congressional districts. A lot of it is in state hands. I mean, biggest picture we need uh, to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act which will put states like Texas with uh, a history of voter suppression in the so-called pre-clearance program, where before we pass a new law impacting access to the ballot box or impacting voter rights, that it would have to be approved by the Department of Justice. I mean, that's what the, the status quo was for decades before the Roberts Supreme Court overruled it. Um, we, we do need, to me, I support these, these efforts to having basically nonpartisan commissions that draw the lines uh, using, you know, uh, I guess, accepted standards. You know, the Texas 10th is a great example of basically the Republicans trying to draw what was supposed to be a permanent Republican seat. It was designed to be 60% plus uh, Republican. They took the, the slice of Austin and combined it with seven rural counties and then these historic Republican uh, suburbs of Houston. Now, you know, uh, population growth has caught up uh, and helping Democrats, you know, the, the change uh, of the demographics in the district has made this a wonderful pickup opportunity this fall. But bigger picture, we need, you know, we need a Supreme Court that will actually uh, hold states like Texas accountable for, for, you know, egregious gerrymandering. We need federal standards uh, through a new Voting Rights Act. And then at the state level, I mean, we're going to have to take control of our state government before we really impact some of this. So I'm very hopeful that, you know, we, we can flip these state house seats, especially in places like Tarrant County, and at least have a voice when the, when the lines are drawn in 2021. Absolutely. Thank you for that question, Sula. If anyone else has any questions, please comment with them and we will get to them. Um, I want to switch a little bit to kind of like the safety measures that the state and federal leaders have put in place during COVID and a lot of, you know, things surrounding masks and people refusing to wear masks. Um, what are What are Texans what are you seeing in the district right now when it comes to health and safety measures that are needed? And what could Congress do more so to help ensure that states like Texas don't go through another wave of COVID? Right on. So, I mean, unfortunately, the biggest factors are the, the president and the governor, right? And the president with his just like his bully pulpit and refusal to even wear a mask until a couple of days ago and saying, oh, it's not comfortable. I don't want to. Uh, it's setting a, a horrible example. Um, you know, so I'm seeing a, a fair amount of concern, especially in rural areas where, where folks have been taking their lead from the president and refusing to wear masks. And, 
you know, there's been a lot of uh, terrible instances of COVID-19 outbreaks in this district. Uh, a nursing home in Brenham, for example, had a terrible outbreak. Uh, it's a huge concern for folks. I mean, one issue I've been working on is job site protections. So just to take, you know, one strand of what the federal government could do, uh, you know, we have OSHA, you know, Occupational uh, Safety, uh, you know, Workplace Safety Organization that unfortunately has been attacked over decades by the right wing and has very little ability to protect uh, workers in work sites. I mean, what I'm hearing from, for example, Houston area unions that work at these uh, fossil fuel facilities, there might be a terrible chemical leak and all the uh, operator of the plant has to do is send a fax to OSHA and say, we're dealing with it. And OSHA says, okay, they don't even show up to inspect. And so to strengthen that sort of uh, work, work site, uh, job site safety administration would be a huge thing. I mean, and also to have real standards about COVID-19. I mean, what I would like to see is inspections and enforcement to make sure that there's social distancing, adequate PPE, uh, and that, the, you know, if a worker is sick, that there's actual reporting of it. You know, I spoke to an organizer with SEIU today uh, who was talking to me about the airport workers in, in the Houston area. And right now, if a worker gets sick with COVID-19, the other workers don't even hear about it, which is obscene, right? You've been ex potentially exposed to coronavirus and you're not even getting the most basic of notifications. And so, I mean, uh, I'd also like to see a lot of federal funding, you know, uh, Medicaid expansion and, and all the rest. Um, but really, it just starts at the top. We need a president or a chief executive who is actually more concerned about people than poll numbers and stock prices. And unfortunately, here in Texas and, and then with the United States government, uh, we have two leaders who are just showing absolute disregard for human life. It's, a, it's obscene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have another question when it comes to gerrymandering, and you might have to help me on this one. Um, could Article... I think it might be Article 14 or Article I-4, I'm not sure, give Congress the right to come up with rules for concise districts and redistricting panels. Oh, I, I know, Stephen, he, he's always good for a wonky question that I have to do like a half hour research to really answer. <laughs> um, but big picture, my understanding is that the state controls the redistricting process, but the federal government uh, has authority over the federal districts. Um, and so, but I, I think, you know, we just need a push. I think at the state legislature, we could require, uh, you know, um, objective, you know, nonpartisan uh, maps and so forth. Uh, the, I mean, the federal, the federal government could create all sorts of incentives. I don't know how much it could force Texas to draw the lines one way or another. But for example, it could um, provide economic assistance for those states that do do the right thing. Um, and so I think, you know, that would be, uh, where I come from on that, I'd, I'd have to really like, you know, do a search of the law to come up with a specific answer. 100%. Um, I'm curious what um, what you want folks who are maybe outside the district to know about you and what excitement are you seeing from folks within the district as well that can kind of give us some insight into what is happening in Texas 10? Right on. Uh, so, you know, I'm uh, basically a 21 year public servant. I started out as a public school teacher in Houston, Texas in 1999, uh, worked in the public schools for seven years, first as a teacher, later running uh, after free after school programs for uh, low income children and youth. I've been a civil rights lawyer for 11 years, you know, first in private practice, doing, uh, you know, workplace discrimination cases, representing whistleblowers, uh, challenging racist police policies. And then more recently at the city of Austin as a city attorney, you know, suing Governor Abbott to stop Senate Bill 4, um, fighting housing discrimination. So I have a, a record of being an activist, an organizer, uh, someone that fights for the people. And I think what's most exciting about Texas 10 is that we have the opportunity to not only replace one of the most conservative, you know, Trump loyalists in Congress, one of the wealthiest members of, of Congress, and someone who's, you know, voted with Trump 97% of the time and is maybe the fifth or sixth highest ranking Republican out there. But we also have the chance to flip a seat that connects Austin to Houston. I mean, this should be our district, right? I mean, two major progressive communities, uh, big labor communities, big environmental communities. You know, why isn't this seat ours? And so, you know, that's really what I'm trying to do is mobilize a, a massive, unstoppable coalition uh, to make hundreds of thousands of phone calls and send Michael McCall to an early retirement. And so, uh, you know, I think this is going to be one of the top five or ten watch races in the country in terms of how
is the cycle. And uh, wherever you are, I would love to have your support. Uh, if you could spell my last name correctly, you know, SiegelforTexas.org, I uh, would love to have you involved. What is your ask of folks right now? Is it is it um, for folks to make calls or like, what are you needing from volunteers right now? Well, we, we are giving our volunteers a little break. Uh, we made uh, 150,000 calls in the last week of this campaign uh, with major support from these environmental groups like Sunrise Movement. Um, for volunteers right now, there's not a specific ask. I mean, uh, I, I need to earn the support of the DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, and we're working closely with them. Uh, so fundraising is, is priority number one right now. Uh, and really, because of COVID-19, as much as I would like to run a movement campaign that knocks on every door, we're not even sure we're going to be able to knock doors. And so we're going to make the calls. We're going to write uh, tens of thousands of postcards. So if people do go to our website, you can sign up to be added to the volunteer list so that when the, the time comes, you can write postcards, make calls, send texts. But if folks have a little money, uh, we will put it to great use uh, to replace Michael McCall in November. Mm -hmm. We have, a, I think, a really insightful question here from Samuel. And I'm curious, um, what new information can we infer from the specific results in the election this week that can help us in November? Any new info from the runoff results? Well, I am tremendously excited. And this is where I have to give credit uh, to the two people who challenged me in the primary, Shannon Hutchison and Pratesh Gandhi. I mean, we had absolute record turnout in this runoff. I mean, the idea that uh, in you know a runoff election, there's no presidential candidates on the ballot. It's been delayed one time. It's occurring during a health pandemic, and we, uh, you know, I think it was two and a half to three times the turnout of the 2018 runoff. And so that's just a tremendous sign that Democrats are ready to vote. You know, we could be voting for dog catcher, for president, we're just ready to vote. Uh, and that's extremely exciting. And at the same time, the Republican turnout is suppressed because uh, these folks are not enthusiastic about Trump and Abbott. I mean, these are, you know, you got Dan Patrick saying, well, grandma and grandpa might have to die so our economy can prosper. I mean, so it's looking really fantastic, Sam. Um, and I think we just have to, you know, keep pushing. I mean. I think it's 109 days I have until November 3rd, maybe 110. I mean, we just need to be making calls every day. Uh, I mean, really enthusiastic also about how popular Joe Biden is right now. Um, and so things are lining up. And I think this is good for progressives, right? There have been a few months in history where there's a sea change in politics, you know, whether it was in you know, the 30s and 40s under FDR, under LBJ, you know, the civil rights movement of the 60s. This could be another movement when progressives are swept in. And so that when we're like confronting these crises in DC in 2021, to have strong progressive voices in Congress then, uh, that'll be a tremendous moment. So I'm looking forward to it, but I have to enjoy each day of the journey, of course. We have another question that I enjoy. Um, how do we unite Democrats up and down the ballot in November? No, that's a, a beautiful question. Um, and to me, that's, an essential role that congressional races play. Um, you know, MJ Hager, she's going to be looking at all 254 counties, um, you know, Joe Biden, 50 states, the Electoral College math. But for me, what I can do is I can work with candidates up and down the ballot. And so just to highlight two local races that matter a lot, there are two county commissioner races in November where we can flip seats. Uh, one is in Elgin and Bastrop County, where Cheryl Reese is a tremendous candidate, the former Bastrop County chair. Uh, so if we, you know, if my campaign and everybody else on the ballot helps Cheryl get out the vote in Elgin in that area, that's that's going to mean a lot for the people of Bastrop. I mean, right now they're fighting just to remove Confederate monuments from the county courthouse. Uh, similarly, in Waller County, uh, Kendrick Jones, uh, former Prairie View and M student, uh, one of the youngest people elected to the city council in Prairie View now the Democratic nominee for county commission, if we can elect him, uh, that would be a tremendous improvement for that community. And so my, my plan is to work with state house candidates, uh, city, you know, school board, county candidates, and just to get out every vote, work together, uh, create opportunities for synergy. And to me, that's the way to get everybody excited and we can all help each other. You know, hopefully Joe Biden, or at least his VP comes down to Texas, uh, helps us get out the vote as well. Um, but it should be a lot of fun. Absolutely. And to kind of close us out for this conversation, which I think has been very insightful, um, what is something that you are looking forward to when um, it comes to this race or when it comes to your personal life? Huh. Uh, well, wow. In terms of this race, 
I am so glad to be past the part where I have to distinguish myself from other Democrats. You know, it just, it's painful. You know, it's like, you want to project a positive image, but then these people throwing these barbs, it's like, just to be done with that. Okay, let's just unite the tribes, go beat McCall, go beat Cornyn, go beat Trump. Uh, and, and we're all fighting for these common values, you know, get everybody healthcare, everybody the basics in life, respect democracy, respect voting rights. And so to me with the campaign, I mean, I am just over the moon to just be focusing on McCall now, not having to, you know, talk about my fellow Democrats. And, you know, in my personal life, you know, I just got to keep it healthy and sane. You know, my wife, uh, my kids, luckily, um, you know, so far we're doing well. But just, you know, keep doing the work. Uh, but, you know, put down the job when I get home, you know, have dinner with the kids, read a book uh, and just keep relatively sane and balanced uh, is my biggest goal. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Mike. Do you have any final words for folks? Hey, this is our moment. This is the, the, the moment uh, of U.S. history when progressives have the answers to these massive crises we're facing. It's not the time for half measures. I mean, it's the time to, to be bold, uh, to have a national jobs program, to confront climate change, to you know, push for universal health care. I, I think this is really our time. So uh, really excited to be working with Progress Texas. Thankful for all the work you do. And uh, let's keep doing it, y'all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Sarah. Take care.